Okay, let's go to John 15. We're still making our way through this great chapter. We're right in the heart of the Upper Room Discourse. Our Savior has declared His love in the second person to His disciples. A direct statement telling them He had loved them. Something that up to the Upper Room Discourse had not yet occurred in the teaching of Christ where He made that direct statement I have loved you. Of course, we've expanded on that a good bit. So what I want to do is I want to read verses 13 through 15. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Now, let me tell you where I want to go. It's obvious from these three verses that our Lord addresses the subject of our friendship with Himself. So we're going to look at wherein that friendship consists. Three things principally. Sacrifice, deeds, and communication. And as we look at that wherein our friendship with the Lord consists, we will learn some things that are very useful in developing our own personal friendships and what makes a good friend or a good friendship. Now, Blessed Savior had closed out in verse 12 by saying, This is my commandment that you love one another as I've loved you. And we discussed last Sunday how it is the Savior has loved us. His whole life was a life of love toward us. He loved us in that he served us. And he loved us in the ultimate expression in giving his life for us. And so he capitalizes on that particular point of the ultimate expression of his love when he says in the very next verse, greater love hath no man than this, than that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, that, again, the sacrificial death of Christ is the ultimate expression of his love. I have taught you repeatedly over the years. If you want to know whether God loves you or not, don't look at your everyday circumstances and interpret God's love out of that. You look at Calvary, because in this was manifested the love of God toward us. And he said his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's the greatest manifestation at all. Now, let's just zero in on this fact that Christ laid down his life. It is important that we understand that Christ laid down his life in a way that no other man can or could lay down his life. Because you see, Jesus Christ had no sin, no personal sin. We have numerous verses that affirm us of the sinlessness of the Lord Jesus. That was essential to his being the sacrifice for our sin. For had he had his own personal sin, he would have had to die for his own sin and would not have been qualified to die for ours. And so because Christ had not sinned, he had not forfeited his life by sinning as every other man has done. Uh, We recall the words of Romans 5.12 that teaches us that death is the consequence Of number one, the sin of Adam, who was our federal head and representative, and so we stand in him, and with his sin we fall into death, but also by virtue of our own personal sin. So Romans 5, 12, "Wherefore, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. The death sentence was passed on us all through the sin of Adam, but we've added to that. For that all have sinned. So we die for his sin and we die for our own. We have forfeited our life through our sin. But since Jesus had no sin, he had not forfeited his life through sin. So that means that no man or devil could take his life from him. The only way his life could leave him is if he let it go, if he laid it down. Now, there is a sense of the word in which any man can lay down his life for a friend. For example, if 
uh, one of these children is out in the parking lot and a car is approaching and I push that child out of the way and I take the hit of the car, you could say I laid down my life for that child. Or if somebody is aiming a gun at a friend of mine and I jump in front of it and I take the bullet, I put myself in harm's way, I've laid down my life for my friend. But if you think about it, what actually took my life was the collision of the car. Or the man that shot me took my life and there was nothing I could do to prevent dying. Somebody right now that has a gun on their person could come up here and shoot me right in the heart. And what could I do to keep my life after that? They could take my life from me by that means. But that couldn't happen to the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way his life could leave him is if he gave it up, if he laid it down. And we'll show you a verse in a moment to point that out. But just let me drive this home by making this point to you. There's not a person in this room, no matter how much you might wish you could, God help you if you do, I hope you don't, but there's not a person in this room that could right now just will themselves to die. Just sitting there, just say, I want to die. I'm just going to give up the ghost right now. Anybody want to try it? You couldn't do it if you tried. We, we don't have that kind of power. But Jesus did. And that's why he died. Because he had that power. Notice in uh, John chapter 10, the only way Christ could die was for him to lay down his life of himself. So that's why I'm saying when he says he lays down his life, he's doing that in a way no other man can or could. In John chapter 10, 17 and 18, Jesus said, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I laid down my life, that I might take it again. See, that's the neat thing. He could just give it up whenever he wanted to, and he could take it back when he wanted to. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, which you don't have, and I have power to take it again, which you don't have. This commandment have I received of my Father. He laid that life down because God commanded him to do that. So once he had expended his blood on that cross for the forgiveness of our sins and answering to all the demands of the law, when he had fulfilled everything that the law demanded in payment for human sin, then we read in Luke 23, 46, And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. But there's an interesting thing that we're told about the death of Christ, and that is that he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. We do the reverse. We give the ghost up, then we bow our head. We die, then the head goes down. Jesus puts his head down first, then gives up the ghost, demonstrating in that simple little act that the reason that life departed is he commanded it to leave. He had that kind of power. I'm done. And so he gives up his life. He lays it down of his own power. See, that's the difference between the way we lay down a life for a friend and the way he laid down his. We need some other power to take it from us. He laid it down of himself. Even a person that takes their own life has to have some instrument or means to make it happen. They cannot do it of the command of their own will. You follow that. Jesus had the power to do that, to lay it down and take it again. And in doing that, he showed the greatest love that a man can show for a friend is to lay down his life. Now here is an interesting thing. We notice that Jesus has said, love one another as I have loved you. And then he goes right into the next verse and says, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. So we learn something here about love, and it's something I've taught you before, and God help me, I'll teach it the remainder of my days, is love is measured by sacrifice. Love is measured by sacrifice. How do we know God loves us? By the sacrifice he made. 
We, of course, those famous words. I don't even think we need to turn and look at them. You can't have been an Arminian for a number of years and need to turn and look at this verse because you heard it every Sunday over and over again. It was like they were stuck on it. Two things they preach on all the time. John 3.16 and the Great Commission. And after that, you've heard about everything they have to say. They play that theme over and over and over again. For God so loved the world, but notice the measure, so loved that he gave, gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then we come over to 1 John 3.16. I think it's interesting. We have John 3.16 and then 1 John 3.16 that picks up right where John 3.16 left off and then makes application to us to show that the same is true of ourselves, that love is measured by sacrifice. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us. There's a thing in this verse that I think is very interesting, that I must point out in passing. Notice He didn't just say, hereby perceive we the love of Jesus, because He laid down His life. Hereby we perceive the, the love of God, because He, who's the He? What's the antecedent of the pronoun He? It's God. So that you have on the cross, God laying down His life. For us. This was the sacrifice of God. God becomes, because God is immortal and cannot die, God becomes a man so that God, joined in that human nature, might die for those whom He had sentenced to death, that He might undergo His own punishment. Laid down his life for us. Everything that Jesus Christ did, had, because he was God manifest in the flesh, had all the merit of God in it. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Greater love hath no man than this. We ought to be willing to do that. We ought to love, you should love this church enough to die for it. To be willing to die, to be part of it, to serve it. Just like the Apostle Paul, who ultimately was executed because of the love he had for the people of God and his willingness to tell them the gospel, even though it meant facing martyrdom to do so. He loved them enough to lay down his life for them. He did not hold his life dear for himself. And I talked about that last Sunday. No need to replay that part. And then he gives an example. Whoso hath this world's goods... And seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up the bowels of his compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him. You see, if you're not willing to give to that brother's need, you can't really say you love that brother. Love being measured by sacrifice. And of course, this is true preeminently in marriage. Husbands, love your wives. Ephesians 5.25. How? As Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it. And so... How does a man prove his love for his wife? By being willing to sacrifice for her very life, if need be. Laying down his life. Love is measured by sacrifice. And this is where the subject of giving comes in. Where we take what God has blessed us with and we give. For example, to help our brethren in need when need arises. Or, for example, supporting those who preach the gospel to us. As Paul says in Galatians 6, 6, Let everyone that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. And it's in doing this that you show your love. As we see in 2 Corinthians 8. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 are the great giving chapters. They talk about giving. And they lay down the principles for Christian giving, which we've expounded to you in the past. But in 2 Corinthians 8.8, 8, Paul said, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. You people say you love the saints. Now here's your chance to prove you really mean that. That's not just empty words. That's not just sound, nice sounding platitudes. Here's a chance now to bluntly put your money where your mouth is. Prove the sincerity of it now by what you do in your giving. And he goes on down in verse 24. Wherefore, show ye to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. 
So love is proven by what we give, not merely by what we say. I mean, that's why John said, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. I'll come back to that a little bit later. You say you love and appreciate this ministry. Well, is that as far as it goes, what you say? You say you love the church, you say you love the brethren, but it, when it comes to parting with something that might be dear to you for the health and benefit of that church and that ministry, you will not go there? Never forget this simple little saying. Words are cheap. Deeds are precious. So, love is measured by sacrifice. If you are not willing to give up anything for the one you say you love, you really don't love that person. No matter how much you say you do. If you are not willing to give up anything for the person you say you love, then you really do not love that person. But now let's go back to the verse. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And we know Jesus laid down his life for his children. He taught that in John chapter 10. We've seen it already. And then in the very next verse, he says, Ye are my friends. So what Jesus is letting us know is he was going to lay down his life for these to whom he was speaking, whom he calls his friends. But now there's something that's interesting about this. Here he says he's going to lay down his life for his friends. <laughs> but come over to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And let's read two verses. Verse 8 and verse 9. Uh, verse 10, pardon. Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now let's strengthen the language. And go down to verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. I love verses like that. God, Jesus did not wait for us to sue for peace to become his friends. He didn't wait for us to get right while we were sinners. When we were enemies, right at that very time, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son much more being reconciled, we shall be saved from his life, for, by his life. Now, Jesus died for his friends, and yet these verses tell us that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, while we were yet enemies. Now, before I go any further, let me define the word friend. So we know what we're talking about when we talk about being friends of Christ and Christ being a friend to us. A friend is one joined to another in mutual benevolence and intimacy. Now, that little word benevolence, or big word benevolence, just means that if a person is my friend, and I'm his friend, we're looking out for each other's good. We're interested in each other's good. That's what it means by mutual benevolence. I'm not just in it for the good I get out of it. I'm for the, in it for the good I can bring to it, and vice versa. Mutual benevolence and intimacy. Which means a friend is a person you know extra, extra better than the rank and file of people with whom you come in contact. It's that person that you let into yourself more. And they let you into them more. And, and there's an extra special bond and intimacy. Mutual benevolence and intimacy. Intimacy, that's a friend. Well, brethren, that's not what we were to Jesus before he saved us. That's not what we were to God before he saved us. And the next thing I want to point out to you is here we have Jesus saying he died for his friends. And yet we've got a verse teaching us he died for his enemies. And I want to show you that friends and enemies are exact opposites one of another. So Thomas looks like on the surface we have a contradiction here, but stay with me. Well, let's first of all show you, though I hardly think this needs to be proven, but I don't like to make statements without I prove them with the Word of God. I just like to to establish that precedent to show that the Word of God proves even the most obvious things, that friends and enemies are opposites. We come over to 2 Samuel 19, 2 Samuel 19, 5 and 6. 
Now, this is after Absalom, David's son, who had committed insurrection, rebellion against his father, had seized the kingdom and was pursuing his father to the death. And Absalom met his due, and he was finally killed. And David's over there carrying on, Oh, Absalom, my son, my son, would to God I died for thee. And just really, really, which you say, well, that was his boy. You can understand that. But yeah, he was also his enemy. (laughs) And here the people that were on his side had saved him. And he's still carrying on. And so Joab, and Joab was one of these guys when he was... Wrong, I mean, he was wrong, wrong. But when he was right, he was right. He was one or the other. Joab was a very extreme type of character. Interesting character. So Joab came to the house of the king and said, Thou hast shamed this day the faces of all thy servants, which this day have saved thy life. And I'm trying to imagine how he would have said it. In the lives of thy sons and of thy daughters. You care about your other kids? You know, it is amazing sometimes that some parents get so wrapped up in the kid that's a rebel that they neglect the one that isn't. I've seen people do that. Get so wrapped up in the one that's causing them all the problem that they forget the good ones that stood with them. That, that's something we need to remember people pastors need to remember that a pastor can get so focused on the guy that betrays him that he's overlooking all the people that stood with him and supported him it's like everything went with that person no it didn't Charles Spurgeon said don't despair when members of your church wander off to other hearers they weren't all yours to start with and he was right And he says, we've saved thy life and the lives of thy sons and of thy daughters and the lives of thy wives and the lives of thy concubines in that thou lovest thine enemies and hatest thy friends. You're acting like you don't care anything about us. You love Absalom and he was a declared enemy. But do you see the opposites, people? Enemies and friends are opposites. That thou regardest neither princes nor servants. For this day I perceive that if Absalom had lived and we'd all died this day, then it had pleased thee well. Is that what you wanted? And he told him, you get out there and you talk to those people that risk their necks to save your life. And you comfort them. And he took Joab's advice wisely. And went out there to comfort the people that had gone to such lengths to save him and his household. And then one other verse, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established. Again, to show you the friends and enemies are opposites. Though we all know that. We all know that by just the definitions of the words. In Lamentations 1, 2, speaking of Jerusalem as a, as a, as a weeping woman, she weepeth sore in the night. And her tears are on her cheeks. I just love the way the Bible goes to lengths to explain what happens when you weep. (laughs) Don't you like that? Tears roll down your cheeks. So, I hope you learned something in church today from the Bible. (laughs) I love its simple lessons. Among all her lovers, she hath none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They are become her enemies, which means they are no more her friends. And so we have this verse that says that Christ dies for his friends and yet turns around and tells us that he died for his enemies. How do you reconcile those two things? You reconcile those two things with the word reconcile. That's it. When we were enemies, he hath reconciled us. And the definition of the word reconcile means to bring a person again into friendly relations to or with oneself or another after an estrangement. Reconciliation is when two people are estranged and have an enmity against other, each other, and that's put away and they become friends again. That's reconciliation. And that's just what Jesus did. As we see in, in the process in 2 Corinthians 5, he took that thing 
that made us enemies of God and God enemies of us. And he took it upon himself and put it away with the sacrifice of himself to restore the friendly relations. In 2 Corinthians 5.19, to wit, that is to know. That's what that word wit means. When you talk about a person's wits, you're talking about their knowledge. To wit means to know. That is to know. It's sort of, it's sort of like uh, saying, uh, like we hear people saying really over much nowadays, you know, you know, to wit, that God was in Christ. Again, this was the sacrifice of God. Reconciling the world unto himself, putting them back on friendly terms. But notice what's involved. Not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. My job is to tell you what God did for you. My job is not to do what God did for you. My job is to tell you what he did for you, and that's to bring you back into friendly relations. To reconcile you to himself by putting away that which had brought the enmity. And then we come over to Colossians 1, 21 and 22. Colossians 1, 21 and 22. And you that were sometime alienated in enemies. And see, when we were enemies, we weren't friends. You that were sometime alienated in enemies in your mind by wicked works. Notice those wicked works were coming out of a... Of a, of a mind that had enmity flowing out of a mental disposition against God. Yet now hath he reconciled, brought again into friendly relations. Where did he do it? In the body of his flesh. How did he do it? Through death with this end to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. In every way qualified to be the friend of a God who is holy, unblameable and unreprovable. So Christ died, we can say, to make his enemies his friends. And Christ's death would be so effective in transforming his enemies into his friends that he could say he laid down his life for his friends even when they were still his enemies. Did you get that point? So effective would be his death in making his friends his enemies, his friends, that even when they were still his enemies, he could say, I'm dying for my friends. And that will be the beauty of heaven, is that we will be friends with God and God will be friends with us and we'll walk hand in hand as friend with friend. But the good news is, people, we don't have to wait till we get there to have a friendly relationship with God. I will teach you today how you who have been reconciled can today be the friends of God. That's my message to you. Be ye reconciled to God. God's put you in a situation now where you can have friendly relations. So take it up and start with it and go with it and be the friends of God. But now, like I say, not only does this passage, these passages give us great insights into how we have friendship with God and with Christ, but they also give us a valuable tool for building friendships with each other. And that is, if you want to be somebody's friend, you've got to be willing to make sacrifices for your friend. Friendship requires that you devote time and attention to cultivating them, that you're willing to sacrifice in order to build them. If you are too busy for a friend, you know what that signals? That signals that you are not interested in the friendship. Conrad gave me a book called You Can Read Anyone. That probably will scare you if I master the technique. You Can Read Anyone by Dr. David J. Lieberman. And I thought this was an interesting thing that he had to say that I'd like to quote to you in relation to what I'm talking about. A per person saying he is too busy, and this is not just true of friendship, this is just true of things in general. A person saying he is too busy to pursue something of interest is not truthful. A person who says he is too busy to pursue something of interest is not truthful. Life is a matter of priorities. We all have them. And we make time for what really matters to us. When a person says he has no time... He often means 
that it is not worth his time. Think about that. When somebody says he has no time, really what he often means is, whatever this is, it's just not worth my time. And it may not be. It may not be because we don't have time for everything. That's why we have to have priorities. But my point is this, is that if you really are interested in being someone's friend, you will make time for that relationship. You will make the sacrifices needed to pursue it. But let me say this. Beware of being too possessive and too demanding of a friend who is willing to sacrifice to be your friend. Because you know what that shows? If a person is willing and shows they're making sacrifices to be your friend and you're too demanding and you're too possessive, that shows that there's something about yourself that you are unwilling to sacrifice, that you're unwilling to give. Because a good friendship involves mutual sacrifice, both giving and receiving. For a marriage to work, it's got to be that way. For a friendship to work, it's got to be that way. For our relationship in this church to work, it's got to be that way. There's got to be giving and there's got to be receiving. I think it's Dr. Harley that says we've all got a giver and we've all got a taker. And that giver is looking out for what's good for the other person. The taker is, but the taker's looking for what's good for me. And there's only so far the giver is willing to give before he says, you know what, it's time for me to take if this relationship is going to survive. It's true. We've all got that. And for good relationships, there needs to be mutual giving and mutual taking. And if you think about it, that's exactly what our friendship is with the Lord God Almighty. He gives. Oh, does he give? And we take. But if we're going to walk on friendly terms with God, we're going to have to do some giving too. And that's why, that's, that's that whole issue of self-denial in order to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we're not willing to give up ourselves to the Lord, then we're not walking with Him as His friends. A good relationship involves mutual sacrifice, both giving and receiving. Well, then we move to the next verse. Can you believe I'm done with that verse? Can you believe that? Oh, but wait till we get down to verse um, 16. We'll come to a grinding halt. Maybe, maybe not, but right now it's looking like that. But let's go to the next one, verse 14. To the next issue of friendship. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. So, Christ is shown, God is shown how he is a friend to us. How do we show we're a friend to him? We do what he says. Obedience to Christ's commandments is how we show ourselves the friend of Christ. And listen to this, as this is important. Obedience to Christ's commandments is how we show ourselves the friends of Christ rather than just emotional gusts of intimacy expressing how much he means to us. How many people can give these effusive emotional expressions of how much God means to them? But boy, when the Lord has something that crosses their will, they're not going there. That's not how we show ourselves his friends, by just emotional gusts of intimacy. We show it by keeping his commandments. And this, and of this, we have a classic example set before us of how we show ourselves the friends of God in our father Abraham. Abraham was called the friend of God. And because of his obedience to a trying command, and I mean a trying command, that would run directly counter to his natural affections, and his willingness to keep that commandment when it, read, when it went so counter to his natural affections is the reason that Abraham is called in two places which we will presently see the friend of God. Let's first of all look at the places where he's called the friend of God. Just get that down first. If you're following in the outline, I'm starting at the end and I'm going to go backwards. 
In Isaiah 41, 8. Isaiah 41, 8. Here's the prophet Isaiah. But thou, O Israel, art my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham. And then these two little words. My friend. Wow. Imagine God saying to you, my friend. Abraham, my friend. And this is God speaking through the prophet. And then we come over to Second Chronicles. And it was generally known in the nation. It was generally known that Abraham was God's friend. In Second Chronicles, pardon me, Second Chronicles 20 and verse 7. This is King Jehoshaphat who's praying before God. And he says, Art not thou our God? who did strive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel and gave it to the seed gave it to the seed of Abraham thy friend forever so here we have two places in our bible where Abraham is called the friend of God now let's go back and look at what God asked of his friend come over to Genesis 22 and let's watch Abraham prove how much he was God's friend Genesis 22 And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest. Abraham had waited 25 years for that baby. God had told him that in his seed, all nations of the earth would be blessed when he called him in Genesis 12, which argues Abraham would have a posterity. In Genesis 15, Abraham was beginning to wonder and said, well, I've got a servant. Is that going to be the heir? No, no. You'll have one that'll come out of your own bowels, Abraham. And he, he, he even got despairing again and decided, well, maybe I need to help God produce a promised child. Sound like an Arminian, doesn't it? God needs help to produce children, so I think I'll help him out. So he goes into Hagar to raise up seed. And God says, eh, not that one. He'll not be heir with my son Isaac. Hey, all he did was produce an Ishmael. I love what a preacher said one time. He said, don't beat the bush too hard to try to get members in the church. An Ishmael might jump out. Oh, how right he was. <laughs> 25 years he was past being able to produce a child. And his wife passed childbearing years. He's 100 and she's 90. And God's telling him, you're going to have that baby. And she laughs. She, she goes, oh, yeah, right. Oh, yeah, right. Well, she had one. Can you imagine how much they love that baby? Can you imagine? 25 years he waited. And God says, okay, now take him and get thee to the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. I want you to give him up to me. Kill him. Burn him. But I want to stop. And there's a little rabbit in the bush and it's sweet. It's very interesting when you're studying the Bible, particularly in the book of Genesis, where you notice the first mention of a word. For example, the first place that mercy occurs. And here we have for the first time in our Bible the mention of the word love. And it refers to Abraham loving his only begotten son. Are you with me? (laughs) The first time in our Bible the word love is mentioned, it's Abraham loving his only begotten son. You know the first time the word love is mentioned in the New Testament? It's over in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 17. Matthew three seventeen, when Jesus is baptized. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son. There's that word love, in whom I am well pleased. The first mention of love in the Old Testament is Abraham's love for his only begotten son. 
The first mention of love in the New Testament is God's love for His only begotten Son. You suppose God wants us to see a parallel? You think it's possible? Oh, an interesting study is to take Genesis 22 and walk through it and see parallel after parallel after parallel with what happened when Christ was offered up as Abraham was to offer up his son. And so here, I mean, can you imagine a more difficult commandment that crosses the natural affection of a man? Can you imagine one more, more challenging, to put it mildly, than the one that God gives to Abraham? And yet in verse 3, what happens? Abraham rose up early in the morning. He didn't even dawdle, didn't even hesitate. Rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. And he went there and he put the wood down on the altar and he laid Isaac down on that wood, bound him, bound him. Oh, my God. And did you know that Isaac had to carry the wood? (laughs) Isaac bore the wood upon which he would be sacrificed, just as our blessed Savior bore the wood upon which he would be sacrificed when he carried his cross. Huh. Interesting, isn't it? And then Abraham takes him and binds him. You realize when they came to get Christ to take him to be crucified, they bound him. And then he lays him on that altar and he lifts that knife. He's got it ready to thrust it through. And God says, Abraham, Abraham, and he stops him. But to all intents and purposes, Abraham offered his only begotten son. Accounting that God was able to raise him from the dead. Now, boy, that was faith. Because he knew that was the promised son. And he knew that God had a purpose and a plan to be fulfilled. And for that purpose to be fulfilled, that boy would have to live. And that boy would have to have children. And so if God wants me to kill him, then it's going to be God's problem. And he'll just have to raise him from the dead. He accounted God able to do that. What faith! In Hebrews chapter 11, it says he counted God able to raise him from the dead, from which also he'd received him in a figure. I mean, Abraham was dead as far as being able to begat a child, and he did. So he figured if God could resurrect my child procreating abilities, he can raise this boy from the dead. (laughs) But now notice, we come to James, and this is the commentary that takes us where we want to go. In James chapter 2, and verses 21 through 23... Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Even though he didn't kill him and burn him, to all intents and purposes, God took the intent for the deed. He offered him. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works? And by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, and here it is, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And this scripture also was fulfilled, and he was called the friend of God. How did Abraham show himself the friend of God? By doing what God told him to do, even when it crossed him. How do we show ourselves the friends of Christ? Doing what he tells us to do, even when it crosses us. When it crosses our natural affection. When it means even the ultimate self-sacrifice. If I join that church, my family will turn against me. Follow Abraham and be the friend of God. As one example. You see, brethren, our greatest concern above everything else should be to be the friends of God. Even more than to be the friends of men. But notice in this particular case, it is friendship to one who has authority over us. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. To be friends of one who has authority over us, and this is true in any context, requires that we respect that authority and do what he commands. So if you want to be the friend of somebody who has authority over you, you've got to respect that authority. And do what that person commands. When my nephew was in the army, he was very good friends with his commanding officer. And on the weekends, they would go out and they'd take their jeeps and they'd do whatever they do. these people do with jeeps. Jeeping, I guess, is the word. I don't know. I'm not into it. You'll have to talk to Kevin and my grandson about whatever you do with jeeps on a weekend. Well, that's what they would go out and do. 
But my, my nephew was a person that understood authority. He could be friends with his commanding officer, and they could go and they could do friend fun things. But he said, come Monday morning, that man was my commanding officer. And if he said do, I did. I think it's interesting that when you look at the roster of King Solomon's cabinet, I'm, 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 often, I'm often amazed by this. You go to 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse 1. King Solomon was king over all Israel. And these were the princes which he had. Azariah the son of Zadok the priest. Eli Horeph and Ahiah the sons of Shisha scribes. Jehoshaphat the son of Ahilad the recorder. And Benaiah the son of Jehoiada was over the host. And Zadok and Abiathar were the priests. And Azariah the son of Nathan was over the officers. And Zabud the son of Nathan was principal officer. Here's Zabud the son of Nathan the principal officer. And then this little detail inserted. And the king's friend. This is the only one that's mentioned. And all this crowd. The king's friend. This is a man that understood authority. This is a man that understood when he could wear the friendship hat and when he could wear the servant hat. And he knew how to switch off between those two and one never get in the way of the other. And if a person doesn't know how to do that, then they just can't be that close with someone in authority. And that works with Jesus Christ too. You have to be able to respect authority to be the friend of the authority figure. And that's going to be worked that way with Jesus. But here's the beautiful thing. For us to be the friends of Jesus, we must keep his commandments. We must serve him. But look at this. This is so beautiful. Come over to Luke chapter 12 and watch this thing work two ways. Watch the giver and the taker side kick in on both sides of the equation. In Luke chapter 12... Jesus said in verse 35, Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. Folks, stay ready. Jesus is coming back. Keep your lights shining. Keep your loins girded. Don't just relax and think this world is it and that's all there is. Be ready to leave at a moment's notice. For we know not when that shall be. So we need to be all the way ready. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning, and ye yourselves liken to men that wait for their Lord. Now, I, I, a searching question. Are you waiting for the Lord? Are you really waiting for Him to come? Does your life demonstrate that you're living in anticipation of that moment? Waiting. When He will return from the wedding. And when he cometh and knocketh, that they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Watch it now. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself, and make them sit down, and will come forth and serve him. You show yourself the friend of Christ by serving him. Doing what he commands. But guess what? He's going to turn that around one day and serve you. That blows my mind. Imagine that great day of his coming. We rise from the dead in glorified bodies. And we enter in. And Jesus says, okay, now sit down there. Sit down there. Here's the menu. What would you like me to serve you? What would you like today? Come out. He's waiting the table, folks. He's waiting the table. We... Him whom we have, he whom we have served will one day serve us. All I can say when I read that is, what a friend we have in Jesus. Yes. But this verse gives us another insight into friendship. To build friendships requires personal sacrifice. But it also tells us that friendship is demonstrated by what we do rather than merely what we say. You're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. And we're done with that verse. Can you believe that? Even you look shocked. You're not used to me getting done with verses that quickly, are you? No, she isn't. (laughs) Even the children are aghast that I could get through a verse that quickly. 
And then we come to this last one. Verse 15. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I've called you friends. For all things that I've heard of my Father, I've made known unto you. Now, Jesus is telling us this title of friends was something that he would call his disciples from henceforth. Now, that word henceforth means from this time forth, from now onwards. Which means that up to this point, and to be sure, read the Gospels and you'll see it is so, he had not called them friends. But from this moment and this upper room discourse, from that time forward, he would call them friends. So a disciple of Christ, a follower of Christ, and that's what these were sitting in that upper room, is considered by him as a friend rather than just as a servant. What a thought. That if I am a disciple of Christ, denying myself, taking up my cross, following him, continuing in his word, loving him above all others, which even above my own life, which is required to be a disciple, being willing to forsake all that I have to be his disciple, that I'm not only his disciple, I'm not only his servant, he calls me his friend. Does that mean anything to you? Matthew Henry said, those that do the duty of servants are admitted and advanced to the dignity of friends. Now, how did Christ demonstrate this friendship? Why is it that he calls them friends? He explains why it is. He said, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. For I have called you, but I've called you friends. Why? For all things that I've heard of my Father, I've made known unto you. Christ demonstrates that he considers his disciples his friends by communicating. Here comes an element in friendship. Communication. By communicating to them all things that he had heard of his Father. And think about it. If you read the New Testament, which is the communication to us through Christ and his apostles of everything that Christ received of his Father communicated to us fully in those 27 books of the New Testament and signed out in Revelation 22. If you read that and then you read the Old Testament in the light of all that Christ revealed to us in the New Testament, you find that Christ has revealed to us, his disciples, the entire course of human history from the start to the finish and where we fit in the overall scheme of things. Now, how's that for insider information? Everybody wants insider information. This is one of the things I think that people get so fascinated with conspiracies about because they like to know what they're up to and what's going to happen. You know, we love that insider information. And you've got to watch out for that, people, because a lot of that can feed the vanity of the flesh. You know, I'm in the know. I'm in the know. Well, just let me say this one word of caution. Whoever it is that's providing you information so that you are in the know, please ask yourself this question, please. How do they know? And then take it from there. How do they know? It's, it's worth considering. But here's the thing. If you're really into the Bible, and the Bible is really into you, you are in the know. You're in the inner circle. You've got the inside information as to the whole course of this world, where it is going, and where you fit in the scheme. So that if you really study your Bible and know your Bible, nothing in tomorrow morning's headlines should come as any kind of surprise. The King James Bible is always a step ahead of the latest news. Do you hear me? It is always a step ahead of the latest news. Always. Now, that's, see, that's what I call friendship, to be brought into that kind of information. And, so, and, and even to the point that I know what Jesus is doing. I know what he's doing now. I have never seen him, but I know what he's up to. I know what he's about. I know what he's planning to do. <laughs> Somebody I've never met. Now, that's what I call friendship. Friendship. Mm. Now, to be sure, now let's get this into perspective. When he says, I call you not servants, I call you friends, 
This does not mean that we are not still the servants of Christ, because we are. We are still his servants, to be sure, considered so both by him and, if we're thinking correctly, by ourselves. For example, in this very same upper room discourse, in which he says, I've not called you servants, but friends, we read in John thirteen thirteen, you call me master and Lord. And you say, well, for so I am. And then he goes down in verse 16, For verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that sent greater than he that sent him. So at no point should we ever think we're greater than Christ. He's the Lord. We're the servants. That's why we're supposed to wash feet. It is a physical demonstration of the fact we don't think we're above the Lord himself. Anybody that thinks it's beneath them to stoop and wash a brother or sister's feet thinks, they're, thinks of themselves more highly than they should. Amen. It was not about beneath our Lord, and it's certainly not beneath us, and that's the demonstration of it. John fifteen twenty. In this very in just a few verses down, after he says, I call you not servants, but I call you friends. He said in verse 20, Remember the word I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. He wants to rem- us to remember, we're still servants. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. And then on down, just to show that in some sense he still considers them his servants. So, well, just stay with me. Because he calls us friends and not servants, that doesn't rule out that we're still servants. It's just in some respect, he is dealing with us as friends rather than servants. You follow? In the larger scheme of things, yes, we ever remain as servants. But there is a particular context, a particular way in which he deals with us as friends and not as servants. But still servants we are, and still he calls us that. Because we read over here in John 18, uh, in verse um, 37, uh, pardon me, verse 36, when he was speaking to Pontius Pilate. And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants, see, notice what he called us, my servants would fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. And boy, there's a lot of preaching in that verse, but I'm going to just leave it alone, other than just to show you that Jesus still considers us servants and calls us thus. And we're to consider ourselves that. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 22. For he that is called in the Lord being a servant is the Lord's freeman, and likewise he that is called being free is Christ's servant. When you go out to do your job on Monday morning, you go there not only to serve your master, which you should, but to serve Christ. As you read in Ephesians 6, 6, not with eye service as men pleasers, do your job not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. And then 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1, Peter was one of the ones sitting there when Christ said these words, I call you not servants but friends, and yet Peter says of himself in 2 Peter 1, 1, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. So, when it comes, listen, when it comes to his authority over us as Lord and Master, we are his servants and always will be. But when it comes to communication, we are more than servants. We are his friends. Do you see that? When it comes to his authority to command us, we are and will ever be his servants. But when it comes to communication, that opening up and letting you in, we are his friends. Because we know what our Lord doeth. And that servants usually don't have a right to know. Now, in conclusion, and I think this is a very important thing while we're dealing with the friendship of Christ. Friendship of Christ seen in sacrifice, deeds, and communication. If we're going to have friends, those three things play into it. Sacrifice, deeds, not mere words, and communication. Letting a person in. Letting a person know you. Not just little shallow statements that appear friendly but keep everybody at a distance. Some people are masters at that. No, letting someone in to know you and letting 
you let them know you and you know them. That's communication. That's vital. That's vital to friendship. And, and remember this in all of this, that a marriage, if it's what it ought to be, is a friendship. In the Song of Solomon, the bride and the groom are called friends. Well, these elements all play into that. For a marriage to be a friendship requires that both husband and wife be willing to sacrifice for the other, to sacrifice for the one that is their spouse, to do, to do, not just to say, and to communicate and open up. And we all need that, people. We all need friends. The person that doesn't think they need friends is a person, I'm going to tell you, that is psychologically damaged. Not that we aren't all, to some extent. But in the, just the general run of things, anybody that thinks they don't need friends, that person's got a serious, serious problem. Amen. Serious problem. I mean, look, people, we were made originally to be the friends of God and to walk with Him in the garden in the cool of the day. Friendship mirrors the relationship we are to have with God. To say, I don't need friends, is as good as to say, I don't need God. I think it is through friendship with each other that we learn to relate to God as a friend. Just like children relating to parents, relating to their father as a father, are learning by that how to relate to God. And yes, even with their mother. Because there is about God that is both fatherly and motherly. And I could give you a verse to prove that. All right, now come over. It is important when it comes to being the friend of Christ that you be certain that you experience that friendship on His terms as stated in His Word. To seek it otherwise is to open yourself up to satanic delusion. Let me repeat that. If you want to be the friend of Christ, you be sure that you pursue that friendship and seek that friendship on the terms he stated in his word. Because to seek it otherwise is to open yourself up to satanic delusion. You set yourself up, and many people do, for satanic delusion. Because remember, one of the key things that demonstrates the friendship with Christ is he communicates to us all things that he's heard from his father. So when you seek communication from Christ beyond what he has already communicated in his written word, you may get that communication and it may seem like a glowing warm friendship. It's a devil. Amen. You better watch out. Some who seek a more intimate relationship with God fall into the snare of what the Bible calls familiar spirits. Posing as the Holy Spirit. Oh, Vern, I'm sorry. I yelled. Did I break your eardrums? Oh, you got earplugs. Good. That's the only time I really bolted out like that. Poor Vern's got sensitive ears, and I, I forget, and I wax eloquent, and I boom, bang out like that. But He needs to hear it. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. But people who seek a more intimate relationship with God on terms other than what he states fall into the snare of familiar spirits who pose as the Holy Spirit. Because it's interesting that devils who communicate messages to men are interestingly enough called in the Bible familiar spirits. Quick, quick run of verses here. Let's go. Uh, Leviticus chapter 19, 31. Leviticus 19, 31. Regard not them that have familiar spirits... Neither seek after... See, regard them not. Don't, don't pay attention to what they say. Neither seek after wizards to be deviled by them. I am the Lord your God. And then come over to Leviticus 20 and verse 27. Leviticus twenty twenty seven. A man also or woman that hath a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. God considered this very, very dangerous and not to be tolerated in the nation. And then come over to this one in 1 Samuel 28 where King Saul had actually banished all the witches and all those that had the familiar spirits. But then he got in desperate straits and guess what he did? He sought one. And then look at this. This is interesting. In 1 1 Samuel chapter 28, 6 through 9. And when the Lord, when Saul inquired... Now now hold this because I'm going to show you something that on the surface looks like a contradiction. It isn't, but there's a great lesson in it. 
in 1 Samuel 28 and verse 6, And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not. Now it says he inquired. And God wouldn't answer him. Neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. And then Saul said unto his servants. Now let me show you how in earnest God was about seeking an answer from God. When he didn't get one, well, he'll go to the witch. And then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. And he went and two other men with him. And they came to the woman by night and said, I pray thee divine unto me by the familiar spirit. In other words, I want to know something to come. I, I'm getting this battle with the Philistines and I want to know the outcome. So, so let me in. Let me in on the outcome. I want to know the future. I need to know the future. No, you don't any more than God has told you in his word. That's all you need to know. And so he says, bring, and, and, and he says, and bring me up, him up. Whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off all those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest a stare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swear and said, You won't die. All right, now go over to 1 Chronicles chapter 10. Look what happened as a result of this incident. But notice something that on the face of it looks like a contradiction, but like I say, the the seeming contradiction is really a very, very valuable lesson for all of us. In 1 Chronicles chapter 10, 13 and 14, So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, And also, here's another reason God God let him die. God killed him. And also, for well, actually he killed himself. But that's another story. Which he kept not. And also, for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. And inquired not of the Lord, therefore he slew him. Wait a minute. Didn't we just read in Samuel that it said he inquired of the Lord? And when the Lord didn't answer, then he went to this woman with a familiar spirit. And yet this verse said, he didn't inquire of the Lord. And here's the lesson that reconciles the seeming contradiction. God does not consider that you have inquired of him unless you inquire on his terms. And when he gives you point blank commandments and you rebel against those commandments and yet you turn to him when you want to have answers, God considers you are not inquiring of him because you have not shown respect for his authority by doing what he told you to do. Capiche? That means, does that, you understand? You get it? That's why God says in the book of Proverbs, people that rebel against him and will have none of his counsel, he said, you'll call but I'll not answer. God doesn't even consider that you've inquired of him. Listen, what Saul should have done when God didn't answer, he should have said, "Uh uh-oh, something's wrong somewhere. I better examine myself and find out what's wrong with me, why God won't answer me. Because you see, people, that had happened once before. This wasn't the first time that when Saul called, God didn't answer. Back over in 1 Samuel chapter 14, we read in verse 37, Saul asked counsel of the Lord. Shall I go down after the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into the hand of Israel? But he answered him, Not that day. And Saul said, Draw near hither all the chief of the people, and know and see wherein this sin hath been this day. What Saul should have done when the Lord didn't answer is get on his knees and say, Lord, I have sinned. And boy, had he ever... In 1 Samuel 15, God had told him, I've taken your kingdom away from you and given it to another better than you. He gave it to David. And what did Saul do? Tried to hold on to the reins of power and kill David. What he should have done is said, bowed to the judgment, handed the authority over to David, handed the throne over to David, and he could have served the rest of his days in an inferior capacity under the authority of David and everything would have been wonderful. No, he didn't want to give up that power. You want to hang on to it. So instead of getting right with God, when God didn't answer him, he sought after a familiar spirit. Now here's a practical lesson for all of you. If there comes a time in your life that you're not getting anything out of your Bible reading, 
that is just reading empty words on a page, communicating nothing to you, and you go to church, and you're not getting anything out of the messages, you're not learning anything, you're not getting anything, you better look at yourself. God's not communicating. You've got a problem. And instead of saying, well, I don't know what was wrong with the, I don't know what's been wrong with the pastor lately. He's not feeding me. Your first question should be, what's wrong with me? Excuse me, Vern. I'm, I'm waxing eloquent here. Here we go. Well, anyway, Scripture absolutely forbids consulting with familiar spirits. Read it in Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 12, where he sandwiches is in there with necromancy and, and well, Deuteronomy chapter 18. He lists off a bunch of things that he forbids. Deuteronomy 18 in verses uh, 9 through 12. And he says, you, 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 this is not to be tolerated. These are abominations. Things like divination, observing times, you know, watching horoscopes, enchanters, witches, charmers, consulters with familiar spirits. See, they're looking for information from those spirits. A wizards or a necromancer. You say, well, what does this have to do with friendship? Here's what it has to do with it. The definition of the word familiar. It means of persons and their relations on a family footing, extremely friendly, intimately associated, intimate. The thing about dealings with familiar spirits is it feels so intimate, so warm, so close, so much like a friend. And therein lies the entrapment. Bear in mind that that word familiar that's used to describe those spirits in your English Bible is also used to describe intimate friends in Job 19.14 and Psalm 41.9 where an intimate friend is referred to as a familiar friend. These devils pose as friends and create an intimate relationship which can be very emotionally and satisfying, hence the entanglement. Piece of advice. If your children ever tell you about an imaginary friend, check it out and make sure it's only imagination. Because the devil's out for your children and don't you forget it. Don't you forget. Even television movies will present that as a nice thing where the child has this invisible friend. Of course, we know television is primarily the devil's racket. Don't get me on that one. Anybody, with any Christian that watches with biblical discernment knows the devil's pushing his messages. And so John 15, 13 through 15 clearly sets forth how we relate to Christ as our friend. Just consider what you have in friendship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me, let me bring this to a finality. Think about what you have. Number one, he died for you to save you forever. Could you ask for a better friend, considering there's no greater love than a man lay down his life for his friend? (laughs) His written word assures you of your standing before him. Are you a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ? A believer? Just read what he says you are to him. He hears our complaints And yes, sends relief. You think of every complaint you've had in your life. Somewhere, he sends relief. His written words speak instruction and comfort for all the varied circumstances of life. To say nothing of the fact that he supplies all our need according to the riches of his glory in Christ. Philippians 4.19 And read Psalm 23 and walk through those verses. And when you get done, ask, could you have a better friend? Could you have a better friend than one that does all that for you? As outlined in Psalm 23, you say, well, what does Psalm 23 say? Um, Have you been to a funeral? (laughs) Go read it. When you consider all that the Scripture has to say about Jesus and our relationship to Him, we can but exclaim, what a friend we have in Jesus. And lastly, this verse gives us another insight into friendship. You can gauge the closeness of a friendship by how much you and your friend open up and communicate about yourselves. 
how much you open up and communicate about yourselves. And oh, Jesus in this New Testament has told us so much. In this whole Bible has told us so much about himself. I don't know if I could handle more communication. I can't even fully get everything he's told me so far. I mean, we just keep studying and studying and learning and learning more and more about our wonderful friend. I don't, I, I'm glad he decided to just, uh, you know, take what I've told you and think about that. <laughs> because he's given me plenty to think about.